do you think that we will scientifically advance a lot over 1000 years or 2000 years and figure out how to explore these moons and explore mars much more deeply i think we already have the technology to send human beings to mars the only question is can we bring them back alive the technology already exists to send people to mars but right now the risk factor is high when it comes to sending humans anywhere we want to make the risk as low and as close to zero as possible so when they sent humans to the moon that itself was quite risky but thankfully there were there were no casualties there was there were no accidents of course apollo 13 was a, a near disaster but it was they called it a successful failure because they were able, able to bring the astronauts back alive to the earth and the cosmic horizon is getting smaller all the time what do you mean smaller because the universe is expanding and at the edges it's expanding faster than the speed of light so all the galaxies at the, at the edges are going beyond what we can observe eventually what's going to happen is we in a few billion years we'll only be able, able to observe the milky way nothing else all the other galaxies will have gone abhijit chavda is back on the ranveer show this time in his professional avatar we've done history episodes we've done geopolitical episodes but this was a dream episode for me ever since the podcast began long ago i'd seen this fantastic web series it was called cosmos it featured neil degrasse tyson an internationally renowned astrophysicist but i strongly believe that one of the best astrophysicists in the world especially from a media perspective sitting right here in india with us and we barely know anything about his scientific side we've done a few science episodes in the past but this one was a deeper deep dive into the world of science we spoke about the birth of the universe what happened right after the big bang what happened during the big bang what happened before the big bang how did the earth get formed how did the dinosaurs get formed are we related to some ancient alien race let's have a scientist break down all these concepts and who better than scientist alpha omega abhijit chawda he's back on the show this one got a little deep a little technical i urge you to keep up because if you can keep up with the entire episode you'll be the most fun most geeky but most respected person at social situations because you'll have scientific gyan to dish out this is ac on the runway show follow us on spotify every episode's available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world abhi ji chavda with another blockbuster episode begins right now by the way there's a part 2 because part 1 part 2 together got too heavy this is just part 1 right up till the dinosaurs got extinct <laughs> AC welcome back to the science special of TRS in the recent past we've done too many history too many geopolitical conversations though by profession you're a scientist you're an astrophysicist to be more specific what does an astrophysicist do we study the mysteries of the universe the big mysteries of the universe where is the 95% of the universe that's missing where is the mass where is the energy mm. and what are all the laws of physics all about and what do we not understand all of that mm. put together So today's theme for this episode because we've kind of touched upon your subject matter in one of our past episodes I'll also link all our past science episodes down below there's some fantastic hindi ones as well that we've done but for today's episode we're talking about the ancient history of our planet mm-hmm. and I don't know how much that contributes to your field of study so when you're actually studying the mysteries of the universe are some of the clues present on our planet itself a very minimal clues actually we could look for fossilized evidence of dark matter perhaps we could lo- look for that in rocks perhaps and so, so on but typically we don't study the earth we study the far away astrophysical objects like stars and galaxies and nebulae and uh, black holes and quasars and pulsars and magnetars and stuff like that we try to piece all the information together the evidence together and understand the universe better mm, okay let's do a little bit of a recap before we begin to dive into the earth's ancient history uh why don't you kind of explain what dark matter is to those of us who forgot right so dark matter is about l- roughly 23% of the mass energy composition of the entire universe hmm. so when we look outside you go out in the in, in the night look at the night sky when the lights are not on you see all kinds of stars if you take a telescope you will see galaxies you will see nebulae you will see all kinds of astrophysical objects you will see dust clouds mm. you take all of 
what is visible you add it together you get a certain amount of mass you can add that up and you can you can roughly calculate how much mass there is that amounts to less than 5% of the actual mass energy of the universe how do we know the actual mass and because we know how fast the universe is expanding we know how fast or how slow galaxies are rotating so and and based on the luminosity of a galaxy and how much mass you can see there you can actually deduce how fast a galaxy should rotate and we find that it doesn't match our observational evidence which indicates there is much more mass in that galaxy but we are not able to see it mm. so that's how we know these things exist so when we say something has mass it means it occupies some space it has weight mass is not weight mass is energy equivalent it does occupy space but sometimes some mass may occupy space but may not be visible certain massive particles can pass right through you and you will not even feel a thing mm. there is something called neutrinos mm. so every second trillions of solar neutrinos pass through your body and my body every second mm. do you feel a thing we we feel nothing they have a tiny minuscule amount of mass we don't feel it they interact via the weak interaction the weak nuclear interaction and we don't feel that at all you they don't pass in a straight line right they do they do pass in a straight line yes is there enough space in our bodies for it to pass in a straight line it passes right through everything it passes right through the atoms in our bodies it can pass right between the electron and, and the nucleus of an atom it can it may even pass through the nucleus itself of an atom how does it go through the nucleus of an atom it simply doesn't interact okay see for instance if i were to push my finger through my palm my my palm will resist this mm. because this is the pauli exclusion principle in the electromagnetic interaction at work at the same time that's why this matter occupies space when it comes to the weak interaction it's a extremely weak interaction it's stronger than gravity but much weaker than the electromagnetic interaction and that's why when a particle that interacts only weakly through the weak interaction passes through you it typically simply won't interact with any of the components constituents inside your mm. body and that that's how it typically happens so Okay before we actually move into talking about the theme of today's episode I want to ask you one question which I've always wondered about if you clap if yeah. you join your hands together is my hand touching my other hand or is the electron from my right hand touching an electron from the left hand and creating a repulsion because of negative meets negative therefore they push away each other and that's what I'm feeling as a mass repulsion of my two hands against each other when we do this it's not actually touching Mm. you go deep inside you take a, in case such a microscope exists and you go right at the intersection of these two hands you will find there is a very small gap in between mm. right so it is the electromagnetic interaction which makes matter occupy space it's the pauli exclusion principle which comes out of quantum mechanics that makes matter occupy space and as two massive particles let's say two atoms come close together they may most likely not even touch each other and they will be repelled by each other in some cases you may have some some interaction some touching but typically atoms have some distance between each other right mm. so that's what happens but it it seems to us like we are touching and interacting mm. it makes you think about concepts like god <laughs> like if god has truly created us how crazy did his or her mind have to be you know to create this complex world with complex rules that we're still discovering Do you ever think about things like that as a physicist? Why not? I am a human being after all. Mm. So look, if you want to truly understand the mind of God, I think the one of the best ways of of doing that is to try and understand physics because physics represents the rules that God wrote down in mm. case God or the gods exist. Right? The rules that he wrote down for us to discover. For us to discover and the rules that govern the universe. Okay? Right? And those rules are encoded in mathematics and in the and and all the uh phenomena that we observe. Uh math and often like advanced mathematics reveals truths about physics uh and if you really want to get to know the mysteries you have to go to the depths of advanced mathematics is that right to say so mathematics essentially encapsulates the patterns and regularities of the universe okay that's what mathematics actually is but mathematics itself isn't physics mathematics can represent any category of objects genuine i mean physical objects or even non physical objects you can create a mathematics out of infinite dimensions if you want there are certain things like hilbert spaces that that exist in uh, hilbert space has infinite dimensions you can create a 11 dimensional theory called the string theory 10 dimensional mm -hmm. theory string theory which may or may not be true but it works that way mathematically so mathematics is all about categories 
it's okay. all about uh, logic applied to categories of objects could you say it's very high quality paint that you can then paint different universes with and different are uh, the mathematics that we know only applies to our universe in a different universe you may have 2 plus 2 equals 5 we don't know how other universes work so the mathematics we observe and we understand only applies only reveals the truth about this universe the one we inhabit does our mathematics reveal that there could be other universes uh it's not mathematics that reveals this it is the extrapolation of what we know about the universe that the universe is expanding that's why in the past it must have been contracted into a single point maybe a singularity and if such a thing happens in this universe maybe there was a a universe before our own mm. maybe it's a cyclical universe or something like that and maybe there are multiple universes by extrapolating the extrapolating that to other universes as well so it's something that we speculate it may be true it may not be true we don't know because we don't have observational data or evidence to support that but it's certainly possible mm. okay fair let's uh, get to the big bang sir one why did it happen two what was there before the big bang three how do we know that the big bang happened uh Why did the Big Bang happen? See, the best theory of the universe that we have is the Big Bang theory. You'll have to explain it as well. Yeah. So the Big Bang theory says that at time t equal to zero, at the very beginning of time, everything that is that exists within the universe, all the stars, all the galaxies, all the light, all the radiation, all the dark matter, all the dark energy, all of that was concentrated together in a single point. That's how the universe initially was then something made the universe expand the space time within the universe expand it was not an explosion it was not a bang it was a, an expansion of the universe how slow or fast was it uh well actually the when we physicists think of time we think of it as if from a logarithmic perspective you know the logarithmic scale yeah, yeah. exponential scale so initially the expansion was incredibly fast yeah initially there was something called inf the inflationary epoch in which space time expanded super luminally which means that the expansion of space time was faster than the speed of light mm. so you can go beyond the speed of light only in terms of the expansion of space time itself but when you're traveling within space time you cannot break the speed limit of light what happens if you do you simply can't the laws of the universe prevent you from doing it but theoretically if you try to do that your mass becomes infinite Mm. there is something called uh, in in relativity the faster you go the more massive you become mm. and if you want to reach the speed limit of the the light speed you have to have infinite mass so it's it's unphysical you can't have that right it's not possible like your atoms disperse no then the, the it's it's not a quantum theory it's a macroscopic theory so we don't talk about atoms and molecules in this let's say you have 1 gram of mass and you're making it travel at uh, 100 kilometers per second it's going to be 1 gram but if you just start uh, pushing it to relativistic velocities you're going to have the, the mass is going to increase from from a certain perspective and the faster it goes the more massive that 1 gram piece of mass becomes it may become a kilo it may become 100 kilos and the closer you reach the speed to the speed of light the more massive it is and some something gets added to it no then it just the mass only increases the mass only, only and increases. that's a mystery it, it's not mystery it, it's just the law, the 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 equations of uh, special relativity okay they tell us this happens okay explain e equals to mc square also so <laughs> so e equals mc square comes from quantum theory okay it's one of the most fundamental and clearly the most famous equation in all physics it says that energy and mass are actually equivalent we have light light is photons photons are packets of electromagnetic energy now photons are massless because they travel at the speed of light which which is why it's light but each photon has a certain energy e equals h nu where nu is the frequency uh, which is the inverse of the wavelength right so what is the wavelength it depends on the color certain photons are so energetic you can't see them the electromagnetic uh, sorry the infrared light which is not visible x rays are also photons even gamma rays are incredibly energetic photons so light has energy and energy has an equivalent mass and that is why photons also can be thought of as having a certain amount of mass even though they are massless so that's how it goes so that's why photons there is something called radiation pressure the solar wind 
is plasma, but there is also radiation that comes out of it. And you can use that in a technology called light sails. So you take a very thin sail, hmm. a very thin sheet of metal or whatever, you shine laser pulses at it. It's just light. It's going to propel it forward. The light, the photons have momentum. And momentum also can be thought of as something that comes from mass, but it's actually from energy. Mm. So in quantum physics, the E equal to mc squared relation tells you that mass and energy are equivalent. If you have m, whatever it is, you can multiply it by it by the square of the speed of light and you get an equivalent energy. Mm. Okay, fair. Uh, coming back to the Big Bang, sir. So after the universe started expanding, what happened? After the universe started expanding, first there was inflation, hmm. then the inflation ended, then there was an, then there was a period of expansion. Initially, the, the universe was very, very dense. In the very beginning, it was just pure energy. Hmm. Then as the universe expanded, it cooled down, but it was still very hot. And then you had the first, atom, the, so the first uh, protons and electrons that formed. And you also had the sea of photons, which was going through that. Okay, and so what was there before? If if you said the first atoms formed. The first protons and neutrons initially. The first protons and neutrons formed. So what was there before the first protons and neutrons? Because your viewpoint of the universe is that everything is made up of protons, neutrons and electrons. That's 5% of the universe. Okay. Okay. That's what we're taught in our science textbooks. Yeah. So initially you had just pure energy, essentially. W what did it look like? No way to say. Just Just photons, just light you can think of. But as it expanded, photons are light, but extremely energetic light in, in the very beginning. So it was not visible to human eyes. Of course, there were no humans at the time. Yeah. Like if, if you were to place a human there, what would that human see? Nothing. Black. It was dark. Dark. But Just, there actually was light, even in the darkness. That was extremely highly energetic light, way beyond the in, uh, ultra um, ultraviolet. Mm. So see, we see the spectrum of light, the, the rainbow, the lowest frequencies that you see are the red frequencies and the highest frequencies are the violet frequencies. There is a frequency spectrum beyond the violet, which is invisible to us. We can't see it. Then if you go even more energetic, it's X-rays and even more energetic than X-rays, you have gamma rays. Gamma rays are extremely dangerous because they are ionizing radiation. They will knock electrons out of your atoms in your body. They will break chemical bonds. They will mutate your DNA. That's why gamma radiation is extremely hazardous. So is X-ray radiation. So in the very early universe, when it was just energy, it was extremely highly energetic photons, uh, very highly energetic gamma rays, essentially. Then the universe expanded. It cooled a little bit. As it cooled, it, it gave rise to matter and antimatter. Protons, antiprotons, Neutrons, anti-neutrons, electrons, anti uh, positrons, that sort of thing. But there was slightly more matter than antimatter. So matter and antimatter, when they meet, they annihilate each other and give rise to pure energy again. Like but, an explosion. Yes, an explosion of energy, pure energy, boom, that sort of thing. But there was slight, for, for whatever reason, there was slightly more matter than antimatter. That's why when the universe expanded sufficiently, we have more matter. We don't encounter ant antimatter anywhere. But we can create that in particle accelerators. So Which is what happened at CERN. Yes, we can create antimatter in CERN. Very s minute quantities of that are created from time to time. Why don't you actually explain what happened at CERN and why it was such a big deal in the world of science. And I remember before that experiment took place, news media was saying that, could this be the end of the earth? <laughs> could half the planet get destroyed? What's the logic? So uh, the latest uh, instrument, particle accelerator that has been constructed and operationalized at CERN is called the Large Hadron Collider. It takes extremely high energetic particles, very accelerated, accelerated to close to the speed of light, like 0 0.99 times the speed of light, almost the speed of light. So these are subatomic particles. They are accelerated and they are smashed together. Mm. And we want to see what comes out of the smash, the, the debris of the, of the collision. Right? And the one particle everybody was looking for was the mysterious Higgs boson. So there are 17 particles in the in the standard model of the in the standard model, out of which we know that the photon exists. The photon is the mass, is the mediator of the electromagnetic force. You have the W and Z bosons that are the mediators of the uh the the, the weak nuclear force and so on. But one 
boson one particle was missing which is the higgs boson missing as in like which we had never discovered it we have we had never encountered it we had never seen it experimentally observationally theoretically we knew it exists theoretically it was post- it was it was theorized by peter higgs in the 1960s and, and a bunch of other people other scientists that such a boson should exist otherwise the universe would not have mass but for a human life what's the point of discovering that we don't know what the application is of the higgs boson yet or what is it uh the higgs boson is what gives mass to the universe there are certain particles that are massless the photon is massless right some particles are massless some particles are very have very little mass and some particles are very massive why is it so so in quantum field theory there are no particles there are simply fields and the 17 particles of the standard model are 17 different fields and each proton each electron these particles are merely local uh disturbances in that infinite universal uh, photon proton field neutron field etc mm. so the universe is actually an illusion whatever we see is an, is an illusion it's just fields that we are we are also part of fields so if such a higgs boson did not exist then the universe would not have mass so the theory is this there is a boson there's a particle called the higgs boson which imbues the universe with mass certain particles interact weakly with the higgs boson field with the higgs field those particles have a small mass some particles interact strongly with the higgs field those particles have a large mass some particles simply don't interact with the higgs field those particles are massless So that's the theory that was put forth in the 1960s and everyone was looking for this X boson because we had discovered other bosons like the W boson Z boson and so on this one particle was missing we had never found it experimentally and maybe it's because our particle accelerators were not strong enough were not powerful enough we they did not accelerate the particles to high enough energies But when you say particle what is a layman supposed to visualize an atom let's say we are firing two protons at each other a proton is the uh, nucleus of a hydrogen atom Hmm? a hydrogen atom is a proton at the center and an electron going around it yeah. you strip away the electron you are left with a proton that is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom let's take a, a, a beam of protons you you accelerate that to 0.99 times the speed of light and you take another beam of protons coming in the opposite direction and you make them collide and let's see what comes out of this big massive smash up it's a very highly energetic smash up because it's almost at the speed of light um so because the particles are traveling with such incredible speeds their masses increase like we we just discover we just discussed right so we're going to have a very massive collision and the mass of the collision the energy that results out of it is, is much more than the energy of two protons because there is the energy of the of the uh the axle the speed also which which increases the energy so you may have some exotic particles that are formed temporarily just just fractional of, of, of momentarily in that collision and the and the large hadron collider has various instruments that record a photograph so to say a snapshot of what came out of the collision what weird particles came out of it and because the lhc the large hadron collider is the most uh, most energetic the the most powerful particle accelerator is it's it accelerates particles to the highest velocities ever achieved thus far so it was hoped that this part this uh, experiment will help us see evidence of the higgs boson and i think it was in 2012 or whatever year it was that we finally discovered this higgs boson there's a new particle that appeared that had never been seen before and eventually it was confirmed that this is the missing and long sought after higgs boson which journalists were calling the god particle mm-hmm. so yeah that's what happened why is it called god particle just it's just a name just for fun why is the big bang called the big bang it was not an explosion <laughs> but somebody called it the big bang i think it was fred hoyle who called it the big bang and this name caught on even though he meant it in a derogatory manner mm. because he was trying to make fun of this theory but it actually turned out to be true mm. <laughs> do we know how long back the big bang happened the big bang happened 13 point nearly 13.8 billion years ago okay. that's the best uh, calculation that we have how do we know that how do we know that is a very good question so when we observe the universe let's say we take snapshots of galaxies right far away galaxies we see that the further a galaxy is away from us the more red shifted it is now what is red shift we know the doppler effect when a train is coming towards us and, and, and it's uh, it's uh, putting out its siren the pitch is 
is shifted high it's highly shifted and the moment the train passes by you it, it goes low in the shift yeah mm. the, the the sound changes even though it's the same uh sound so that is called the doppler effect so when something is coming towards you and it's emitting waves those waves will be compressed and the frequency will be higher when that object is moving away from you it's emitting waves the waves will be stretched out and the frequency will be lower the same thing also applies to light light waves so when an object is coming towards you the frequencies the wavelengths of the light that are coming towards you are squashed together they are shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum so that is called blue shift and when something is receding away from you the frequ- the wavelengths are stretched out and it everything appears more red so we have certain uh, a uh, certain frequencies like the like the uh, sodium line you when you burn sodium when there is a f- uh, when you take a snapshot of of uh, light from a galaxy you know exactly where the sodium line is going to be because we know the frequency we can test it in the lab and various other elements also they have certain characteristic signature frequencies but when you look for it in the in a far away galaxy you will see that the sodium line is shifted towards the red side and depending on how much it is shifted you know how fast it is receding away from us So for every galaxy that you see which is far away you see that every galaxy is red shifted which means the all the galaxies are moving away from us and the further a galaxy is away from us the more red shifted it is which means that the acceleration is expanding the further away it is the more the faster it is moving away from you mm. so we know the universe is expanding all far away galaxies are moving further and further away from us and that acceleration that, that expansion is accelerating only the andromeda galaxy is coming towards us it's going to collide with us with our galaxy in about 2 and 1/2 billion years because it's too close to us that's why the gravitation uh, attraction is overcoming the expansion of the universe does it matter that it will collide with our no. galaxy because there's that much space for all the stars to find their own space yes so what is going to actually happen is not a collision but a merger merger the mm. galaxy is mostly empty space so mm. the stars are just going to pass through in the empty spaces there's going to be no collision as far as it's it's extremely unlikely that there will be an actual collision between anything mm. so eventually there will be a gravitational dance which will last a few billion years and then you will have the formation of a new super galaxy milkomeda or whatever you want to call it <laughs> that's, gonna, that's what, what's going to happen wow so we know that the galaxies are getting further and further away from us so we know at what speed the universe is expanding if you ex- extrapolate that back in time you know that the universe if you go back in time it must be it must have been smaller mm. and if you calculate this properly it works out to be about about 13.8 billion years mm. what's at the edge of space the edge of space that's a good question so uh, there is something called the cosmic horizon the cosmic horizon is about 95 billion light years that's the diameter the diameter of the cosmic horizon so the cosmic horizon is a sphere with us at the center and that's how far we can see in the universe beyond that we can't see anything because beyond that the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light so that's what's happening so that's how far we can observe there is definitely a universe beyond what we can observe but it's forever lost to us we'll never be able to see that mm. it's gone beyond our cosmic horizon and the cosmic horizon is getting smaller all the time smaller what do you mean smaller because the universe is expanding and at the edges it's expanding faster than the speed of light so all the galaxies at the, at the edges are going beyond what we can observe eventually what's going to happen is we in a few billion years we'll only be able, able to observe the milky way nothing else all the other galaxies will have gone wow this is a mind mending think concept. about it like this you have a balloon <laughs> you blow it up you have points on the balloon as you blow the balloon the points go further and further away from each other mm. and if you make it fast enough they're going to go away faster from each other at the speed of light or faster than the speed of light so if you are at one of the points and you have all the surrounding points and it's expanding eventually the, those surrounding points will go further and further and further away eventually they will no longer be visible that's how you can visualize that wow are we just fungus on a planet that suited to growing fungus <laughs> like like where do we stand as human beings like what is the earth um somewhere along the timeline of the universe in these 13.8 billion years uh there was a massive star which exploded that was uh kind of that gave rise to our sun if i'm not mistaken what preceded our sun in this exact part of the universe where we exist So stars are typically uh born out of 
self gravitating clouds of dust and gas mm. self gravitating means they have a center of gravity and they're all moving around that so it typically takes the shape of a disk now where does this cloud of gas and dust come from it typically comes from the uh, outcome of a supernova explosion which is the death of a star but even that star came out of a cloud of gas and dust so where does that cloud of gas and dust come from, from? another supernova explosion and if you keep winding back where you do go back to the big bang Okay. the origin of the universe so our sun is most likely a second or third generation star right so so uh, the solar system was born out of a proto stellar or proto solar disk uh, the formation of the solar system happened about 4.6 billion years before today hmm? and the earth the proto earth the very rudimentary hot molten gaseous earth was first born most likely around 4.5 billion years before today and it looked and felt very different from what it is today it was extremely hot it was very hostile to any kind of life you can imagine uh, it was molten there was like volcanic activity all around there was an atmosphere there was no water initially most likely the atmosphere was extremely different from what it is today it was completely toxic a whole different cocktail of gases and then there was something called the late heavy bombardment a massive amount of meteors etc uh, impacted the earth and most likely it is these meteors that brought in the water but uh, this happened in a burst like as if someone took a gun and fired it towards us or it happened over time uh this was all part of the evolution of the solar system so initially as the solar system formed there was this massive there were lots of planets lots of ancient planets that formed and many of them collided together and burst into pieces lots of debris and there were ancient rocks from the previous solar system that were still around so all of this was swirling together in this massive chaotic mixture and because of that there was a period of a few hundred million years where there was this massive constant bombardment of meteors on the earth basically our solar system was a lot more rocky than it is today it was more chaotic it was it was very rudimentary and it was still forming the planets were still shifting positions some of them were colliding there must have been many many more planets at the time slowly what happened is that the gas giants reached the the orbits where they are today and they shepherded lots of asteroids out of our way so there are there's a there's an asteroid belt between the orbits of uh, mars and jupiter so that probably is an ancient destroyed planet but those asteroids have been shepherded out of our our way by the gravity of jupiter and saturn and there there are these uh, trojan asteroids that are also shepherded by jupiter they lie on the lagrange points of jupiter what's a trojan asteroid uh, they are called trojan asteroids because they sit on the lagrange points of jupiter i'm not sure where the name came from i i don't remember right now but there is something called lagrange points so these are points of equilibrium between the gravity of a planet and the sun Mm. so you can place an object in a lagrange point which is either between the earth and the sun or behind the earth and the sun or at uh, 60 degrees angles in the orbit and the mm. same goes for jupiter and other uh, planets as well so jupiter has these lagrange points where you have clusters of 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 asteroids which are called trojan asteroids i think human beings don't understand how much jupiter and saturn protect us from yes. cataclysms yes. like as in the earth would have been destroyed if jupiter and saturn didn't exist yes um so many more questions you know all this and these kind of podcasts humble you out a lot like you just realize how insignificant you are in the grand scheme of things in the grand scheme of time like if you think of the time your grandfather was young which is what like 70 years ago which is what in the grand scheme of things and i've been of time he probably exists at the same time as you when you look at it from a macro scale yes you know and makes you realize how insignificant the events around you are today oh, there is this very famous image from hubble also from the james webb telescope it's called the pillars of creation you can put that on the screen so there are these massive pillars of dust that exist far away in a certain uh, region of space these pillars they look like fingers okay and if you look at the tip of each finger it's twice as wide as our solar system and it looks this much this this just this large in the image so that tells you that even though our solar system is so vast and we understand so little of it it's actually that small and completely insignificant in the grand scheme of things what do we not understand about our solar system we don't know how many planets are there oh f- really <laughs> really yes 
like there could be more that are like There's undiscovered way more than we imagine further than pluto or further than pluto we are discovering new minor planets all the time first we thought it was only up to flu- up to pluto then we discovered something called eris further away from pluto which is bigger than pluto we have discovered sedna we have discovered quaar make make haumea lots and lots of these objects and there is most likely something much more massive out there which is distorting in the orbits of far away solar system objects in the kuiper belt etc but it's all revolving around our sun yes. the same sun that we see yes why are we not taught this in science textbooks i have no idea maybe it's it's something that happened very recently so these discoveries have happened typically in the past 15 20 years uh, maybe science textbooks are updated every 200 years or something i don't know what it is so that's why <laughs> it, it takes a little bit of time you know wow um fuck do we know what's on these planets uh these these are classified as minor planets nowadays it's a bureaucratic thing what tag you put on what thing pluto was one of the planets earlier now they have classi- reclassified it as a minor planet and then there are planetoids and planetesimals and what not kuiper belt objects and trans neptunian objects all kinds of various categories they've created but these are all solar system objects in orbit around the sun and most likely way beyond the orbit of pluto there is something unknown out there a massive object more massive than the earth most likely which is causing the orbits of the objects that orbit so far away to be uh inclined at a certain angle which would not happen otherwise so it looks like there is something more much more massive out there at least one super earth kind of planet but it's so far away or maybe it's so dark that we can't see it why do you call, call it super earth and because not- its mass is is most likely going to be a multiple of that of earth Okay, like three, four times, maybe ten times, possibly. Why don't you call it Super Jupiter? Because it may not be a gaseous planet. It may be a terrestrial, rocky kind of planet, possibly. Possibly. More important, maybe, maybe it's a black hole. Really, maybe it's a small black hole in orbit around the sun. That would explain why it's not visible. <laughs> Who knows? It's a possibility. And our physicists is actively looking for these mysteries. Astronomers are actively looking for Planet Nine or Planet X, whatever you want to call it. they are but they, thus far they have found nothing hmm maybe it's the closest wormhole for all you know <laughs> possible wow okay mind bent already um anything else that fascinates you about our solar system um i think everything is fascinating i'm fascinated with with venus it's our closest i think it's one of, it's either mars or, or venus which is the closest maybe maybe venus it is a very earth like planet almost the same mass but one day on venus is i don't know how many years on earth like the rotation speed is very very slow and it it rotates in the opposite direction as what earth and other planets rotate and the atmosphere is about 300 times thicker than that of earth and there is a constant rain that falls on venus it's sulfuric acid rain there's lightning it's it's a uh, torrid environment it's hot enough to melt lead the atmospheric pressure is about 300 times that of earth it's very reflective and uh, yeah it's it's a mystery you know why did this planet become like that what kind of it's clearly a runaway greenhouse effect that happened on this planet right so that's a mystery and there are various uh, moons of jupiter and saturn that could harbor life because they seem to have under surface subsurface oceans of liquid water we can see that on certain places in in certain moons then there is this moon of saturn called titan that has hydrocarbon lakes and it seems to have uh, it clearly has a very thick atmosphere uh, the huygens probe did touch down on titan it, we for the first time saw what the surface of this moon looks like and there are many more mysteries out there so it's a fascinating place our own solar system we understand so little about it it's quite possible that there could be microbial life on some of these moons because there is liquid water out there there is a geothermal activity on these moons yeah it's even possible that there could have been life on mars in the past because we know there is there was flowing water in oceans on mars there are so many mysteries the solar system itself is is incredibly fascinating mm you know you spoke about there being microbial life on these moons for all you know there could be something larger than microbial life maybe some sea monsters down there possible we, um We had an astronaut on the show, and I was talking to her about the progress of science when it comes to space exploration. And she said that it kind of 
improves in steps you know you make your way to the moon now you're figuring out how to make your way to mars you sent a man on the moon now figure out how to send human beings to mars um then you figure out like the next step gradually being a scientist and you know kind of just i'm expecting a very practical dry answer from you but either way i'm going to ask you the question um do you think that we will scientifically advance a lot over 1000 years or 2000 years and figure out how to explore these moons and explore mars much more deeply and for all you know maybe what if we find some kind of compound that can protect you from the atmosphere of venus and at least send a robot there first do you think all this is possible i think we already have the technology to send human beings to mars the only question is can we bring them back alive the technology already exists to send people on mars mars but right now the 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 risk factor is high when it comes to sending humans anywhere we want to make the risk as low and as close to zero as possible mm. right so when they sent humans to the moon that itself was quite risky but thankfully there were there were no casualties there was there were no accidents of course apollo 13 was a, a near disaster but it was they called it a successful failure because they were able, able to bring the astronauts back alive to the earth so the technology existed to send people to the moon in the 19 late 1960s we already have the technology to send people to mars uh, mars but the only thing is will we be able to bring them back alive that's the thing technology improves iteratively you first send a spacecraft in orbit around the moon you do that successfully then the next step is you try to make it land on the moon you make that work then you will have a return mission you make it land on the moon then it comes back to earth with some samples mm. you do that then you can have a much more larger spacecraft maybe a moon base then you can start sending humans there then with mars also you do the same thing you first send an uncrewed mission to mars send it in orbit around, around the planet and bring it back if that works you make it land take back some samples and bring it back then possibly you will send humans there and that's sort of thing so it's always a step by step step by step thing i think within the next by 2040 i'm sure somebody will have landed on mars most likely uh, i'm sure elon musk will want to be the first person to make this happen mm. i think it's quite likely that by 2040 if everything is fine if the geopolitical climate is all good then we will be able to see humans landing on mars and hopefully coming back and by the end of the century you could have permanent bases on mars possibly it's quite possible mm. now when you spoke about sending people to venus etc in the future you could have technologies where you can have skin coverings that are like 5 or 10 or 20 atoms thick and that can protect you from the vacuum of space and from the atmosphere of venus whatever it might be like yeah it's possible mm. um i mean who predicted smartphones 30 years back right like you don't know where science and technology can take us in saying that have they've got samples back from the moon right yes what did they discover in those samples they discovered that uh, the moon's uh, rocks are pretty similar to that of the earth which kind of indicates that the moon was born out of a collision between the earth and some ancient planet and a lot of earth material was ejected it went into earth orbit in the form of a ring or so and eventually it coalesced into what is now the moon so the composition of the moon seems to be quite similar to that of the earth but of course there are some 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 uh dissimilarities for instance the surface topsoil layer of the moon which is called the regolith is most likely highly abundant in helium 3 which is an isotope of helium which could be an extraordinarily good future nuclear fuel for fusion reactors which is why there is a geopolitical race that's going to ignite about going back going back to the moon going to ignite Yes, uh, the Chinese claim to have discovered some new mineral on the moon, which seems to have a good potential of being used as a fuel in the future. Which is the same thing? Ah, uh, something else. I don't know exactly. I don't think it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So there is a massive amount of resources on the moon. There is water on the moon. Water is one of the most precious commodities in space. Why? Because you need to, it to sustain life, and it's very expensive to put one kilo of anything into orbit. Mm. from the earth but if you already have hundreds of tons thousands of tons of water on the moon why bring it from the earth from the, from the earth just use it whatever is over there so that's why the the polar region of the, of the moon where you have certain craters that are permanently in shadow and which clearly have water those regions are going to become prime geopolitical real estate for future lunar exploration exploration the first time water was discovered was in 2009 or 10 when the chandrayaan uh, explorer 
uh, did a certain experiment it crashed a probe into a crater and what came out included water mm um if we had to just move to the surface of the moon right now in this moment what would we see we would see desolation we would see a a surface that is full of dust grayish dust it is believed it is supposed to smell kind of like gunpowder somehow yeah it's it's soft but it's a, the, the below the surface a, a layer is quite uh, compact of the moon there are moon quakes from time to time little little earthquakes small ones and the horizon isn't as far as the earth's horizon is so typically if you if you look out to the horizon on the earth it's about i don't know 7 kilometers away 7 miles whatever it is yeah on the moon it's much less much 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 lesser because the moon has a much smaller diameter and the gravity is about 1/6 of that of the earth so if you can jump let's say 3 feet on the earth you will be able to jump 18 feet high on the on the moon mm. that's how it is yep. and obviously there is no atmosphere there so you have to wear protective equipment the, the space suit and all that and and the uh, there is no afterglow of the atmosphere that we see in on the earth in the earth over here the atmosphere itself glows because of a light that is diffused by the clouds and the dust and all that on the moon the moment the sun sinks below the horizon it's dark all out and the sky is black and you can see see stars shine but they don't twinkle they just points of light mm. in space because there is no atmosphere so that's the kind of environment you have on the moon you can't look directly at the sun when you're on the moon no you can't you'll basically burn your eyes you'll go blind so what did these guys do when they they were have these visors the, the apollo astronauts that went to the moon they had these visors visors that had gold coating which ensures that even if you by mistake inadvertently look at the sun it's not going to destroy your vision so much fascination i have with space technology in general like even if they had to take photos with a camera what kind of camera could like survive in that kind of temperature and space yes they had to all the equipment that they took there was purpose built for uh, for being able to function in the vacuum of space right so in those days you do not have the kind of cameras we have today they had film cameras so they had to take specially purpose designed film cameras for that even the first time the soviets the first time humanity saw a picture of the far side of the moon was when the soviets had sent up a probe around the moon so that probe was the first probe that that spacecraft was the first spacecraft to to circumnavigate the moon and take pictures of the far side and it took those pictures on that the tape film you know the old film camera kind of thing and then it relayed that back to the soviets and i think the americans were able to intercept that so they also got images of <laughs> the far side of the moon pretty grainy but it's the first time we saw that let's talk about the far side of the moon sir is is it correct uh, that there is half the moon which never sees the light of the day because of its nature of revolution and rotation so um the earth and the moon are locked in a tidal resonance it's a phenomenon that you see with various uh, systems that have a parent object and a, and a moon so that is something that comes out of the classical physics so what happens is that the the rotation of the moon matches equally with the time it takes for the moon to take to do one orbit of the earth of the earth which is why if you're on earth you only see one side of the moon but the far side of the moon is not dark it also gets sunlight but we never get to see it in the past we could see it but right now we are tidally locked so it's it's a, it's a phenomenon that happens because of the laws of physics very simple gravitational physics so the far side of the moon was first seen only in the 1970s or 1960s most likely the soviets first saw it and it's a very interesting place the the features are quite different from what we see on the side that is visible to us the most interesting thing about the far side of the moon is that it is completely silent what i mean by that is that there is no noise coming from the earth electromagnetic noise if you are on the near side of the moon there's all kinds of broadcasts and telecasts and all this electromagnetic radiation electromagnetic waves and radio waves all that is complete constantly bombarded over there because of all the terrestrial and uh, space broadcasts that we have on the earth we have fm stations we have radio stations we have uh, free to air tv transmission transmissions all kinds of things it's like when you are at the top of a really tall building you can hear all the roads around you and the That's traffic a, around you yes but on the far side of the moon there is absolutely nothing coming from the earth so if you want to build any kind of observatory the far side of the moon is the best place for that 
because there is no interference any noise any signal coming from the earth that will interfere with your observations hmm what else do you think is there i don't think there's anything special there are no aliens <laughs> uh, i don't know we have not found any evidence of aliens why <laughs> need need me some aliens i mean if i were to write a science, a science fiction story i would certainly place alien artifacts on the other side of the moon mm. where we can't see them but yeah now we have sent uh, we have taken pictures of that place uh, that part of the moon and thus far we have not discovered anything that is unusual or that will be like whoa what the hell is that it's just a continuation of what's on the yes. near side yes mm Let's speak about cataclysmic events because as Randall Carlson says when we look at the surface of the moon and we see craters we think that oh shit the moon's taken a beating from all these meteor showers but if you were to strip earth of all its oceans and forests and buildings and study the surface of our planet it's probably even more uh, dented than that of the moon if you were to take away all the oceans all the surface features like uh, forests etc you will most likely find nothing Okay. I'll tell you why. The Earth is tectonically active. The Earth below the below the crust of the Earth, there is this massive ocean of magma, which is molten rock. And because of the activity of the magma, the flowing of the magma, it's swirling, flowing all the time. It sometimes comes out of the Earth's surface through fissures and cracks, and the, the, those are volcanoes. And because of that, there is this tectonic activity. There are these uh, plates tectonic plates on the surface of the earth that are constantly moving around it's it's like if the earth's crust was an eggshell you've basically cracked the eggshell into different parts yes it cracks and and moves around and reforms reseals and cracks again yeah. it's constantly moving around it this process takes millions of years tens of millions of years but typically after 100 or so million years even if there were meteor impacts they would go below the surface and they would disappear forever mm. there are certain features on the surface of the of the planet where you do see meteor impacts there is one in i think sedbury in south africa which may possibly be the oldest known meteor crater on the planet there is one in uh, manicouagan in canada there is uh, there are a couple of those in canada and the uh, there is there are a few of them under the surface of the sea there could be one of the coast of mumbai called the shiva crater there is yeah. one of the yucatan peninsula half on the peninsula half in the gulf of mexico which happened 66 million years ago which coincides with the disappearance of non avian dinosaurs so it is most likely a sign of what happened where is this it's in the gulf of mexico it is in the yucatan province yucatan peninsula of mexico half the crater is on land it's buried under the surface and half of it is is uh, more than half of it is in the sea it's it's below the surface of the ocean and the impact, the epicenter of the crater is most is close to the village of chikshulub that's why they call it the chikshulub crater mm. and that is the crater that most likely contributed to the uh, extinction of the non avian dinosaurs the mm. avian dinosaurs are still with us mm. of course okay lots of stuff to unpack here i always wondered how asteroids which are maybe even like 100 kilometers in diameter how does an asteroid like that hurt the earth in terms of 100 kilometers is not that much when you look at the earth size and then someone told me okay take a bullet and throw it at someone with your hand it won't do any damage then put it in a gun and throw it and then see kind of damage it does that's what people don't understand about momentum that momentum is also an outcome of velocity these asteroids are kind of surging through space at very high velocities and hitting earth like bullets when an asteroid hits the surface of the earth and there aren't too many that hit the surface of the earth in our timelines when was the last massive asteroid hit i think it was some somewhere in the early 20th century in russia somewhere in siberia uh, i can think of two events one was in 1908 1908 uh, the the it was somewhere in siberia i forget the name of that thing um okay i can't i can't remember the name but i'm sure you can uh, put that on the screen and the more recent one was the chelyabinsk meteor which meteorite which exploded over chelyabinsk it's a town in, in siberia hundreds of buildings were damaged windows exploded all over the place there was a massive shock wave that shook the entire city and the meteor some parts of it actually broke through the ice and and hit a lake and they were able to recover some parts of the meteorite yeah randall carlson keeps saying that with our technologies available we should go out then destroy these meteors which are kind of 
on collision course with the earth uh, because if we actually put our time and resources towards it that technology is about 10 years away which is not that long and it gives us enough time to protect ourselves and we as human civilization don't understand how harmful meteor showers can be on us like if it could wipe out entire races of dinosaurs we don't even understand what it could do to us and even uh, the most recent ice age which was about 10000 bc around that time 11000 bc um was supposedly theoretically caused because of some sort of an asteroid hitting the earth the younger dryas impact yeah, theory yeah yeah um wow so much to talk about here sir and this is actually the juice of this particular episode for me um firstly let's just begin with what an asteroid impact can do to our planet for those people who don't know much about the subject right so uh, if you go out and and, and look at the night sky on a clear on a clear night with no light pollution if you stare at the sky for let's say 1 hour you're going to see at least 5 or 6 meteor trails it's that common and approximately 100 tons of meteor dust falls on the planet every single day so we have impacts but most of these are micro impacts sometimes you have impacts on the ocean that people miss because the oceans cover 2/3 of the of the surface area of the of the planet so there are lots of impacts that we never see but they happen which if they happened on land they'd be very harmful a uh, not very harmful typically these are not very very massive impacts but a typical meteorite or or asteroid when it hits the earth or when it enters the earth's atmosphere rel- relative to the earth it typically travels between 30 to 70 kilometers per second not per hour per second it's way faster than a bullet it's it's way faster than hypersonic missiles it's it's uh, the speed is incredible at that speed when it enters the earth's atmosphere it compresses the atmosphere so 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 much that it it becomes uh, it becomes hot enough to actually burn the atmosphere the air molecules start glowing and vibrating and vibrating and that is what causes the long meteor trail that we observe mm. because the meteor essentially starts evaporating it in and within a fraction of a second most of it evaporates now if it is large enough the meteor may get so superheated that instead of evaporating in a long streak it ev- evaporates all of a sudden in an explosive explosion like a bomb yeah it it's like a nuclear bomb in the sky depending on the size and some some of these are so big that they actually impact the earth while they are in that bomb state yes there is an explosion but some part of it does impact the earth now if a meteor or, or if an asteroid is let's say 10 meters wide that's what gives rise to the tunguska kind of event 1908 which if, did a lot of damage yes it did a lot of damage it it flattened about i don't know how many square kilometers of forest massive amount so a 10 meter asteroid flattened out it was like a small office building kind of thing but still i mean it flattens out it flattened several thousand square kilometers of forest wow that's this is what people need to understand this is the universe that we live in yes and, and there is shit out like you're, if you're scared of sharks <laughs> in the ocean look up for look a up. minute anyway go on yeah so if you have a small office building kind of let's say one small bungalow kind of meteor meteorite it's going to flat flatten several thousand kilometers square kilometers of forest or whatever it impacts yeah most likely it will explode in the air itself but the explosion will flatten everything but if you have a kilometer wide asteroid that's going to be life changing the the asteroid that hit the yucatan peninsula of mexico the chicxulub asteroid was approximately 10 kilometers in diameter between 8 and 10 to 12 kilometers in diameter the effect of that impact was incredible the crater is more than 130 kilometers in diameter the crater the impact crater this impact caused tsunamis that are like several kilometers high and these tsunamis were supersonic tsunamis they were traveling faster than the speed of sound and these tsunamis circled the globe multiple times the atmosphere itself burned up for a few hours the temperature on the surface of the planet was more than 100 degrees celsius very few very little life survived this and then there was much of the earth's crust evaporated in the impact went up into the atmosphere cooled down and then started falling back on the earth like molten magma and lava 
and this uh, and then there was this big global nuclear winter kind of thing where all the soot that was thrown out in the air circled the atmosphere for about 10 years so for about 10 years there was no sunlight so if you're a living being on the planet at the time of an asteroid impact what do you experience initially you will see nothing if you're on the other side of the planet then you will experience a uh, supersonic hurricanes first of all storms that uh, come pass through faster than the speed of sound then you will have enormous 3 2 3 km tall tsunamis that are again supersonic in nature then of course the temperature will rise very fast maybe more than 100 degrees celsius so unless you got very thick skin or you can burrow deep down under the under the ground you can perish in that yeah then there will be the ensuing nuclear winter which means for a, for a decade or so there is be, there's going to be no sunlight so all the vegetation will die out if the vegetation dies out whatever life has survived animal life has survived most of it will die out because if uh, there's no vegetation the herbivorous animals die if the herbivorous animals die the carnivorous animals die so very little survives out of this yeah one thing i found fascinating about uh, this whole conversation is the fact that our ancestors existed at the same time as the dinosaurs and we were the shrews back then yes so this is even before we became monkeys yes like as in the what monkeys are to us shrews are probably to monkeys yes how did shrews which are our great great grand parents survive this kind of an impact they dug under the earth most likely these were like uh, mice like shrew like mole like creatures and somehow they managed to survive they must have dug deep under the ground and held out there for maybe a few days until the temperatures came back to somewhat normal and then they managed to somehow survive the next decade which was almost no sunlight and incredibly freezing temperatures because there is no sunlight they must have survived by scavenging around eating rotting carcasses whatever it of is of dinosaurs of dinosaurs of whatever they found and they somehow survived and finally when sunlight broke through there eventually was new vegetation and these were the only creatures that had survived the this was the dawn of the mammals the mammals became a thing after this event uh how has the most ancient dinosaur in the world today the crocodile survived a nuclear apocalypse like this crocodiles most likely survived because they would have escaped under water but crocodiles are not dinosaurs crocodiles are a completely distinct species dinosaurs did survive the avian dinosaurs survived they are all around us they are the birds if you look at the skeleton of a, skeleton of a bird it's essentially the same as a skeleton of a dinosaur the closest relative of the t-rex is your common chicken you know so birds are dinosaurs the dinosaurs that lived six, more than 66 million years ago they had feathers most of them had feathers and we have now discovered that in the fossil record most likely even the t-rex when it was young when it was juvenile it would have been covered in feathers but as they grew larger the feathers would have uh, maybe dropped off or something but most dinosaurs were feathered dinosaurs and birds are those that survived the avian dinosaurs so while i wish to speak a lot more about dinosaurs this is technically halfway through the conversation i wanted to have with you and i feel it's too heavy by this point we've done a very dense conversation by now i'm going to divide this particular podcast into two parts second part let's talk about the story of the earth from dinosaurs onwards and there's a lot to unpack there as well uh considering that we spoke about asteroid showers as the last kind of element of this first podcast what would you like to tell the listeners about space in general the universe in general a place in the cosmos well space is mostly empty and yet it's not empty uh if you go through space you will find that there is radiation all over the place and that radiation is at a temperature of 2.25 degrees kelvin which is 2.25 degrees above absolute zero which is the absolute coldest temperature anything can get now this radiation that you find in outer space is the after glow of the first light after the big bang and this first light after the big bang emerged about between 250 and 300 million years after the big bang until that time the universe was completely dark mm. why is it so let me explain why when we think of the sun we think of an extraordinarily luminous ball of light but if you were to go inside the sun 
beyond the atmosphere of the sun inside deep into the interior of the sun it's dark it's dark can you imagine that can you believe it mm. let me explain why the sun is incredibly dense at the very core of the sun there is this interior core layer of the sun the core region of the sun where hydrogen atoms are squeezed together by the force of gravity and they are fused together into helium atoms right this process gives off photons which are particles of light essentially but these are extremely high energy photons called gamma rays now the sun is so dense the material in the sun is so dense at the core that this light if it tries to travel anywhere it hits another atom and it hits and it gets it, it gets absorbed then it's emitted again and before it can go anywhere it gets absorbed again this happened again this happens again and again and again so essentially what i'm saying is that a photon that is born in the core of the sun in the interior of the interior of the sun takes between 100000 to a million years or maybe more to exit the sun wow wow <laughs> my god and then it takes it just 8 minutes to reach the earth and give this planet life yes and give it culture and give it religion and all, all of these that. wars that we fight yes my so god. the light we are seeing right now was born maybe a million or maybe more years before today it took that long for it to come out of the sun the universe was once as dense and more dense than the sun so it's only after it expanded to a certain limit that the first light was able to flow freely Mm. and that is the first light of the universe and the and the cold radiation that you find in outer space the 2.5 2.25 kelvin temperature uh, radiation is the afterglow of that first light mm. because the universe has expanded so much it's been stretched out and red shifted into almost nothingness but it's still there and we can measure it this has been one mind bending episode <laughs> i am sure i want to stop it at this point because the theme for this conversation was life in general what is the origins the scientific origins of life why are we here there's going to be no answer to that question at least until the end of part 2 this is the end of part 1 another epic episode with chavda so thank you and i think part 2 we're going to cover everything from dinosaurs to the story of evolution to megafauna to possibly answering that question about what is life so thank you for another epic recording sir most welcome that's right we cut it short because it was just getting too heavy and sometimes as a podcaster i can't make content that's 10 steps ahead of the audience i can only make it 8 steps ahead of the audience i know this was a very heavy episode i'm assuming that we've had ac on the show so much that you guys are comfortable with him speaking about such deep concepts in this much detail um this is one of those episodes that even i'll keep going back to over time just to kind of brush up some of my scientific concepts because trust me the deeper you get into science the deeper you understand life and honestly the more humble you feel about your own existence make sure you don't miss part 2 it was even more fun than this one this one was the slightly more technical the slightly deeper part for more episodes just like this follow us on spotify Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Give me some scientist recommendations. Drop your comments and don't miss part two, everybody. I'll see you later.